Welcome, everybody. Can you all hear me all right? And thank you so much for being here. Please get a last slice of pizza, take your seats. We're going to kick off this panel uh, with a short documentary by one of our panelists, David Feige, which appeared last year as an op doc in the New York Times. I had sex with a 16-year-old female who was my girlfriend, who I was dating at the age of 18 and 19. While I was in gay rehab, I had conversations with my counselor, and part of the conversation, I disclosed some information that I had touched a, a boy inappropriately. I had consensual sex with an underage girl. My charge is computer solicitation of a minor. Never had sex with him, never had contact with him. I was turned in by his parents. My charges were leading to this behavior with a child under 16. Prior to that, I was one of the top racquetball coaches in the world. I spent two and a half years in prison. I was in prison for 10 years. I ended up doing 22 months. I got a year in, in county jail. After my release, I really didn't know where I could go. There's laws in the state of Florida that say you can't live within a thousand feet of where a child might congregate. You know, there's a school here, you know, there's a park there, you know, there's a bus stop down the street. We had searched for places to live and nobody would run to us. We it wasn't for this place, place I would go close. Yeah, absolutely. Close to the people. I think we have 107 offenders here right now. We got sugar cane, corn, and green beans all around us, as far as you can see. Our closest neighbors uh, about two and a half, three miles away. Our sewage treatment plant, our self contained village. We have our own water supply, our own sewage treatment. We're funded mainly by donations. I don't think there's many places in the United States like this. We label people sex offenders or sexual predators for a wide variety of behaviors. So as a result, we have a lot of folks carrying those labels without it really distinguishing between who's dangerous and who isn't. Once you've got the label, you're on the internet. Um, that's your life. Walking into a grocery store, you got photographs up on the wall that has your name. People aren't going to hire you. They find out that we're felons, the application's thrown away. There's not, not even a chance. And especially if it's a sex crime. Corporate McDonald's or Burger King, they don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm going to be on that registry till the day I die. The sad part of it is that, that upsets me as a mother is the fact that this is on him for the rest of his life. Qualifications basically fall under a case by case basis. We do a background, we try to talk to people, find out they're going to be a good fit in the community. We get at least 100 requests a week to move in here for people that need, need housing. But if you're talking about somebody who's 17 years old, none of our guys out here are going to have contact with him because he's a minor. And he's from this county, right? His family's from this county. His okay. crime was in another county, but yeah. his family lives in Joint. This is a situation where this kid has no place, absolutely no place to go. I don't know how people 
survived. You know, we have Miracle Village, think heavens, in terms of there being at least a place where people can live and feel human. But other than that, I don't know how people survive. Thank you again, all of you, for being here today. And many thanks to the NYU Review of Law and Social Change for hosting this innovative panel series on sex offender registration and notification laws. I especially want to thank Olivia Sheck for her heroic efforts organizing this panel series. My name is Sandy Mason. I'm a former New Orleans public defender and currently a Furman Fellow at the Law School. I'm very pleased to be moderating today's panel. Just a quick note, if you came in while the film was playing and you need to sign up for CLE credit, sign up in the upper right corner back there. All right, because this is the first of a three-part panel series, I want to say just a few words about the series as a whole. Sex offender registration is a difficult topic. Sexual abuse is a very serious harm. And it's precisely for that reason that it's important that we as a society think carefully about the measures that we've taken and might take to prevent it. For the last two decades, much, if not most, of the political will and public funding directed to this issue has been channeled into the creation and expansion of regimes to register, monitor, and restrain people with a past conviction for a sex offense. New Jersey's Megan's Law was one of the first in 1994. You might be familiar with that. It was widely publicized. That was followed by a federal law, the Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sexually Violent Offender Registration Act, that required states to create and implement their own registration and monitoring regimes or forfeit a substantial amount of federal criminal justice funding. Today, all 50 states have registration and monitoring regimes. The best estimate I've found is that there are currently 819,218 people on sex offender registries nationwide, and the US has led the world in this arena. In the US, we've reached a transitional moment for criminal justice policy. There's tremendous momentum toward reform, but the conversation so far really hasn't grappled with how our system treats sexual harm and people with past convictions for sex offenses. So the aim of this panel series is to begin to remedy that gap by taking stock of registration laws in the US. Today's panel will explore what registration and notification entails, the components of registration, and the consequences for registrants and their families. Tomorrow's panel will address the benefit of registration regimes, their efficacy in reducing rates of offending. And the third panel on Wednesday will cover uh, priorities and strategies for reform. We hope you'll tune in to the two online panels to come. Right now, I'm thrilled to introduce our incredible panel of experts. David Feige, third in line, is a public defender, law professor, and writer. From 1997 to 2005, he was the trial chief of the Bronx Defenders. He subsequently served as a professor of law and director of advocacy programs at Seton Hall Law School. He's also on the faculty of the National Criminal Defense College. He's taught trial skills to students and public defenders around the country. David has written about criminal justice for many major media outlets, and he's appeared on shows as diverse as All In with Chris Hayes and The O'Reilly Factor. He's the author of a book, Indefensible, which chronicles a single day in the criminal justice system. He is a writer and producer of episodic television, and he is the co-creator of Raising the Bar. He's currently at work on a full-length documentary feature about sex offender laws around the country. David Patton, the far end, has been the executive director and attorney-in-chief of the Federal Defenders of New York since 2011. He previously served as a trial attorney in the Manhattan office of the Federal Defenders. 
as an assistant professor of law at the University of Alabama, and as a visiting associate professor of law at Stanford Law School, where he founded the school's first trial level criminal defense clinic. He's run the Federal Defender Clinic here at NYU, and he currently teaches here as an adjunct professor of law. He's also on the faculty of Gideon's Provis, a nonprofit organization dedicated to training new public defenders and improving the quality of indigent defense nationwide. Nicole Pittman, second to my right, is a leading national expert who has spent the last 10 years doing groundbreaking work questioning the wisdom of placing children on sex offender registries. As a 2011 Soros Senior Justice Advocacy Fellow at Human Rights Watch, Nicole interviewed hundreds of youth sex offenders across the country, and the result, her 2013 Human Rights Watch report raised on the registry the irreparable harm of placing children on sex offender registries in the US, which we have right here, if anyone wants to look at it afterwards, is the first comprehensive examination of this issue. Nicole has provided expert testimony on the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act and sex offender notification and registration laws as they relate to children to more than 30 states and to Congress. She's also presented very widely on these issues. Nicole is currently a Stone Life Fellow at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And Dana Wolf is a Soros Justice Fellow at the New York Civil Liberties Union, where she focuses on litigation and advocacy to address re-entry issues faced by people registered for sex offenses, as well as other criminal justice and civil liberties issues. Dana is a 2012 graduate of Brooklyn Law School, where she was a Sparer Public Interest Law Fellow and member of the Moot Court Honor Society. Prior to law school, Dana designed and managed philanthropic giving programs and was an AmeriCorps member at a Harlem-based microcredit organization. The format of the panel will be a moderated discussion followed by audience questions. We're sending note cards around during the panel, so if you have questions, please write them on the note cards and we'll be collecting them. Um, and with that, let's begin. I want to begin with David Feige, the author of the, uh, the, vi the video that we just saw. David, can you tell us what led you to begin making films about registered sex offenders? And sure. if possible, in your answer, can you explain what a sex offender is? <laughs> a sex offender, unfortunately, is an awful lot of people. Um, and it is a category that continues to, continues to expand in some, um, some, difficult, some difficult and troubling ways. But uh, the root of the, the video, the, the short film and the documentary film um, were obviously in, in, in my time as a public defender. And I watched, I was a PD for I don't know, about 15 years, and I watched as the laws just got more and harsher and harsher, more and more repressive, and broader and broader. And at some point, uh, I think the trigger for me was uh, a moment where uh, in Florida, in, in Florida there was a huge encampment of homeless sex offenders uh, under the Julia Tuttle Causeway. And I had originally wanted to make a film about that, but I frankly didn't have the foggiest idea how, and I hadn't really done any of this stuff before, and so I just kind of tabled that um, until for a, few, for a few years. And then it was, frankly, at, you can probably tell we all kind of know each other, and there's a lot of intersections, and it was actually at um, a Soros Justice Conference a couple years ago where I just decided that I was gonna go ahead and, I was gonna go ahead and do this, and you should know that one of the very first people that I called was Nicole. And it was, in fact, in large measure, we were at Miracle Village because of Nicole. Um, and, you know, so what drove me to do it was, as I look at criminal defense stuff, I tend to eschew the things that I consider easier problems. Um, it is why, you know, for me, the death penalty is less, interest, is, is less interesting. And the things that always interest me are the things that nobody really wants to look at. It's why sex offender stuff in particular, despite the tidal wave of change, has remained essentially out of the reach of um, most reform discussions. And so to me, taking on what I perceive to be the most reviled, most abused class of, individu of individuals um, and try to paint a portrait of their essential humanity and really contextualize the, the political and social forces that drive these laws 
um, was both an intellectual and I suppose an artistic challenge. I was struck in the film you actually didn't choose to highlight the most absurd offenses that can land people on registries, um, which I appreciate. But could you give a, just a quick overview of? You want some absurd, even more absurd examples? Not necessarily the most <laughs> absurd. Just the spectrum. What is the spectrum of offenses that can be deemed sex offenses? I would say that you know, from, from, peeing, from, from peeing in public to being a serial pedophile, um, the difference being that in large measure, thanks to Law and Order, SVU, uh, the, in the public imaginings, sex offenders are almost entirely comprised of you know, serial, serial pedophiles and child rapists, and it's all sort of stranger, stranger stuff, when in reality, that constitutes an infinitesimal portion of what's really, of what's really out there, and the breadth of the net uh, that's cast uh, sweeps up an enormous, number of, an enormous number of people that are not those that the public imagines. Let's zoom out for just a minute. And David Patton, could you perhaps explain to us what the federal, the current Federal Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act, or SORNA, requires of states and of registrants? Sure. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, you mentioned some of the uh, mid-'90s statutes that passed. Uh, so uh, since 1994, there's been federal law governing uh, sex offender registries, but SORNA came along in 2006 and really kind of changed the game. Um, it greatly expanded who has to be on a state's uh, registry if they want to be in compliance, and I should say at the outset, the penalty for a state not to comply with SORNA uh, is that it loses a substantial amount of funding, um, loses a big part of what are called the JAG grants that go to law enforcement and, and uh, justice issues in states. Um, and SORNA basically did two things. It, it governed what states, uh, what state registries have to look like, and then secondly, it created a, a fairly uh, severe uh, criminal, a, a new criminal law failure to register, which is a federal offense, uh, which um, uh, my office, uh, the Federal Public Defender uh, Office, sees quite regularly. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the second piece of it, the failure to register uh, criminal prosecutions a little bit later. But um, the first piece of it, um, it expanded uh, the number of offenses that states were required to include on their registries. Um, it greatly expanded the amount of time people had to be on registries. It categorized the severity of an offender based on this three-tiered system that is just related to the offense of conviction as opposed to the way many states had done it, which is through risk assessment tools, so a much blunter instrument. Uh, it required states to criminalize failure to register by uh, statutes that carry a maximum of at least a year in jail, which basically meant for the vast majority of states that it made it a felony offense uh, to fail to register in the state, in addition to the new found federal criminal penalty for failure to register. Um, it did a number of other things, but those were the main things. It greatly expanded uh, the scope of registries. Um, to date, uh, I, last number I saw, but Nicole know better than, than I do, 17 or 18 states have actually uh, come into compliance with SORNA. So actually the majority of states have foregone a significant amount of funding uh, to not come into compliance with SORNA because of many of its perceived failings. And could you just run through briefly some of the components of registration and notification pursuant to SORNA? in-person reporting requirements um, Sh sure, and the uh, basic notification elements? Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, frankly, Nicole could, could probably better describe the, the details of those. But it increased the frequency with which you have to engage in in-person reporting depending on what tier you're in. I think from uh, the most of every 30 days, is it? Oh, uh, right. uh, so, um, at the highest tier level, you've got to report every 30 days to the lowest level, which, by the way, tier one uh, offenders can be misdemeanor offenders. Uh, so this covers a, a truly wide swath. You wanted examples of the sort of absurd ones. They're covered by SORNA. 
and even the lowest level misdemeanor offenses that qualify um, as a sex offender under SORNA are required to register for a minimum of 15 years. Uh, so it's a significant registration requirement. I forget exactly how often uh, tier one offenders have to, one year. One, ev every year have to show up in person. Um, uh, it greatly expanded the amount of personal information they have to include in their registry. Uh, it created a national website, even though there is no actual federal sex offender uh, registry. Um, there's a national website that pulls from all the state websites to put people's information and photo. You saw uh, a, 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 an example of what that sort of looks like uh, in the op doc. Um, so that there is a national website that contains all of this information. Okay, great. That, that's a good segue to Nicole. Nicole, could you give us an overview of, if you, if you want to add on to David's description of the components of registration and notification, please do. And then could you give us an overview of juvenile registration? Sure. Um, so basically, just in terms of, I mean, uh, David did a great job of explaining but what happens for a person on the registry or a person that has committed a sex offense for a registrable offense, um, they, three days after being released from prison, so we're saying after they have served their time, and that can be a juvenile prison or an adult prison, um, they have to go register in the county that they're going to live in, and they have to register where they're going to live, work, um, and go to school. That could be different counties, and that costs money. Um, in some states that can cost up to the initial one, in like for instance, Louisiana, New Orleans, you have to send out flyers saying to the three mile radius of where you're gonna live. Um, we have one man that spent uh, decades in prison, went in at the age of 16 for a rape and was released at the age of 40. Um, and because he had to register, uh, the immediately in three days he had to spend $1,600 to send those flyers out. He was released with $10. Um, his law lawyers thankfully paid for that, but if he wasn't able to pay for that, he would have gone back to prison. So after those three days, you register, um, and registration means that also um, that you're also on a website in most cases, uh, meaning people can Google your name. There are public websites, there are private websites, there are websites that realtors have. Um, there are billboards. A billboard could go on your lawn. Um, it could say a sex offender lives here. Um, and, um, and it also means when you terms of registration, again, there's fees, there's also waiting in line for many hours, um, and I'm just, just talking in general about adults and juveniles right now. And also, um, what's not in the federal law, but it's in local laws all over the country, are child safety zones and residency restrictions. So meaning that if you happen to live in a place where you can't a thousand feet from a school, you can't go live in that house. So you might not be released from prison. You might have to be homeless. Um, and for kids, that means you can't go to elementary school. If you are a child that's being released and you're on the registry, you can't go to high school. That's a child safety zone. Um, child safety zones are usually within a thousand feet, some, some number of feet within a school, daycare center, park, library. Um, and in certain cities, like a dense city like New York or Philadelphia or somewhere, that's nowhere. That is basically nowhere. Miami, it is nowhere. And that's why those people live in Pahokee, Florida. You can't live anywhere but on the very edge of the ocean. Just, just a quick clarification. Do those apply only to people convicted of a sex offense involving a child? No. Um, it, no, and re they can be for, they can apply to really anyone on the registry, um, and, and including the tier one, including the, including the peeing in public. So just very quickly in terms of just, and I don't want to spend a lot of time because we're going to talk about it, with juveniles, when we're talking about juveniles, which I prefer to say children, um, we're talking about children that have gone through family court, juvenile court, for an adjudication of delinquency. They have not been convicted. They do not have the same due process rights as adults. Um, and everything is supposed to stop at the age of 18 or 21 when they age out of the juvenile system. But for 22 years, children have been included on sex offender registries. There are 40 states today that register children the exact same way that I described as adults. Um, and so we have kids that have been going through this. And the Adam Walsh Act increased those penalties. And what it basically did for the first time, um, just very quickly, that up and from 1994 till 2006, states' laws never included or excluded children. States just decided to include them. 
the Adam Walsh Act decided to define a, a conviction that's registrable as also a juvenile adjudication. And so therefore, children were placed on registries um, in more fashion. And the first version of that was that it's for life. All children are tier three because their victims are under the age of 14, most of their victims. If your victim's under the age of 14, you're usually a tier three, which means lifetime. So all of those things that I talked about, including GPS, lifetime GPS, wearing a monitor on your ankle, those are the things that um, children also have to endure. And a quick thing that I just want to say is that over these 20 years, it's been found that children commit <laughs> reoffend at a rate of about 1% sexually. So we have children on registries for 20 some years. And also out of that 800,000 people on registries, about 200,000 are children. Um, and when we look again, I just want to talk about in terms of the U.S., the U.S. registers 800,000 people. There's only six countries in the whole world that have registration, six other countries, and that totals about 20,000 people, the, others, the other rest of the world. So 20,000 in the rest of the world, 800,000 in the U.S. And just to complete the picture of the scope of registration and its consequences in the U.S., once you have federal SORNA and state laws that are built on top of federal SORNA, those laws create a platform for local municipalities to pass further ordinances. As Nicole was discussing, many residency restrictions belong to municipal ordinances uh, targeting people on registries. Dana has done work related to registry restrictions. So uh, we're going to move into a discussion of, of what, it, what life is like on the registry. And Dana, I was hoping you could start us off by telling us what's been happening about registry restrictions in New York. Sure. Well, the answer to that question um, got a little bit easier a couple of months ago. So I'll start out. There's a, in New York State, there is a state-level residence restriction, which prohibits anyone whose conviction involves someone under the age of 18 and anyone who's determined to propose a high risk of reoffending through New York State's risk assessment instrument, which has never been scientifically validated and is basically a bunch of factors that a couple legislators thought were relevant in 1996, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, it prohibits those categories of people from living within a thousand feet of a school during the time that they're on parole, which is pretty uncommon, post-release supervision, which is very common, or probation. Um, and what that means is that if you don't have a house that's outside of the thousand feet from a school, you cannot, you're homeless, you, you can't go home, um, which is incredibly difficult for people transitioning out of prison who don't have jobs and whose connections with their communities are strained at best. Um, courts have recognized that as a practical matter, this means that most of Manhattan, except for a part of Randall's Island, <laughs> parts of the financial district in Chelsea are uninhabitable for people who are subject to the residence restriction that most of the Bronx is uninhabitable, and that the restriction if works as essential banishment from all of Brooklyn. Um, but these have nevertheless been upheld. Um, the most recent chapter of this um, is that last year, New York State stopped releasing people from prison if they didn't have a house to go home to. So what this means is that people reach their sentence expiration dates. They serve the sentence that the judge sentenced them to. They think that they're going home and they're just moved to another prison facility, told that they're no longer in prison, but subject to all the same restrictions, sleeping next to people who are in the general population, and continue to serve extended prison sentences until um, they can find a place to live, but it's very hard to find a place to live when you don't have internet access, you can only make phone calls if you have a phone account that the prison accepts, and when you have you know, your family doing the best they can to find a place for you. So it's been pretty problematic. Um, on the local level, across New York State, about 130 different towns and counties enacted their own laws restricting where registrants could live. And these laws were much more harsh than the state law. They applied to people not just for a limited amount of time, but often for the whole time that they were on the registry, regardless of the risk of a, uh, uh, their risk assessment level. Um, and they, they apply to a lot more places than the state law. So the state law prohibits people from living near schools. The local law is prohibited for people from living near parks and playgrounds and libraries. Um, and then sometimes went even further, prohibiting from people from living near non-degree granting schools like gymnastics schools or karate academies, arcades, firehouses, apartment buildings. One town, upstate New York, prohibited registrants from living within one mile of the part of town that's zoned residential high density, as in they're essentially K 
can't live within a mile of where most people in the town live. Um, the good news on that front is that in February, the New York State Court of Appeals found that all of these local laws were preempted by the state scheme for managing registrants, um, which was great. And it was a very broad decision. It was called People versus DIAC. It was about Nassau County's law. But the decision went very far and made clear that all of these local laws are now invalidated, which is great. Perhaps unsurprisingly, there's now big backlash at the state level to increase the state residence restrictions, um, which there is on some level within the Senate every year, but which now seems to be gaining some traction in the Assembly this year. So um, that's something to keep an eye on and hopefully won't come to pass. But these laws are very difficult to oppose and very easy to ignore the evidence on and just vote in favor of. So that's where things are in New York. And do you have a sense of whether New York is anomalous? In or, terms whether, of, or whether other states have similar well, landscapes with uh, registration law. <laughs> it is not a non-place. No. no. Yeah. It's, do you, it's you can heartbreaking. Take that, David. It, it, yeah. I mean, th those regimes exist almost everywhere, and I mean, and certainly everywhere that we've been shooting. And in fact, in many places, they're even more restrictive. Uh, and of course, it's the the further the further you drill down, and the more granular you get, the more sort of you, you realize the astonishing ways in which, and creative ways in which they come, they that they come up with to sort of make these stricter. You know, my favorite is how they measure in, say, Miami. Like Miami's full of water. You know, there are places that you just can't get to. It would take you two miles to get to. But they, but but they decide to do it as the crow flies, which create these vast circles of uninhabitable of uninhabitable space in Miami, um, and so that. Quite literally, there is a tiny little industrial zone um, where, you know, when we when, when we went down there, there were about 150 people just camped out in tents, sort of lining this two block this this two block radius, which is the place they're registered to. And similarly, you know, I mean, David mentioned um, the registry schemes in Oklahoma. If you're transient, as many many people are, you have to register every seven days with your GPS coordinates. And if you don't have a car and you and, and you can't be near Oklahoma City, you know, there's a guy who walks 10 miles every single Friday to go in and give his little, mark a spot with an X on a map for the place in the woods where he lives. I think the federal um, SORNA has language requiring transients to register not just their GPS coordinates, but also places where they intend to travel where, or where engage in go. leisure activity. Yeah. Um. So, but no, so no, New York is not by any means alone in that regard. Well, that's special in people, keeping people in prison, I think. Yeah, yes and no. I yeah. mean, there's, the civil commitment regimes are unbelievable. Oh, right. I mean, by the way, you know, as Nicole was pointing out, there are a lot of juvenile. There are a lot of juveniles. There are civilly committed juveniles. There are people in civil commitment who have never been convicted of a crime as an adult. Um, in in Minnesota, the lead plaintiff in the main case challenging challenging the civil commitment um, sort of regime, where by the way, which has existed for 21 years, um, has some 700 people in it. And guess how many people have been released over the years? Zero. No one's ever gone there. Yeah, this um, is a, an entirely, <laughs> not, yeah. not separate, a but another aspect of this issue, which, which warrants its own yeah, panel yeah. series. But for anyway, now, sorry. Nope. <laughs> it'd be great, Nicole, if you could give us a sense of what it's like to be a juvenile on the registry. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and um, again, so my specialty is working on children and that have gone through juvenile adjudications. And it's not that children in the adult system are any less important. It's just that it's, a, it's, it's basically illegal of what we're doing to children and, and, and gripping. Um, so what I did was I, I, I testifying about saying, you cannot pass this Adam Walsh Act. We need to get children off of, the, uh, off of registries. Lawmakers would always say, well, what's the harm? And so as a Soros fellow, I was able to take that on. And um, I interviewed 500 people that went on registries as children around the country and wrote up their stories. And that's in the book, Raised on the Registry, which is right here, um, which you can get on. There's a downloadable copy, copy on Human Rights Watch website um, and can be available to you. Uh, and basically, uh, right now, the question that I talk about in terms of with juveniles, and I'll go into the impacts, it's not have we gone too far or where do we need to go, it's how do we find our way out. We have completely annihilated generations of children and their families by, the, by placing children on registration laws. Um, and I'm not going to go through quickly, we just talked about registration and community notification, um, residency restrictions. 
Um, and something that I just want to talk about quickly on this one is during the super predator scare of the 90s, um, a lot of children, that's when states started to say, oh, children are just as bad as adults, we're going to place them on registries. And a lot of people like Patty Wetterling, who was the very first woman whose son went missing in 1989, um, where registration started in, in Minnesota, um, today she says that these laws would have never helped find her son, and in fact, they're more harmful. And there's no way when I was talking to President Clinton at the time in 1994 that I wanted children to be included on registries. So what is the impact of placing children on registries? Um, this is an infographic that one of my interns and I just made, sort of like a, a, a play on the game of life. And I had been playing this game about two months ago with my niece, my 10-year-old niece. And we were talking about opportunities, going to college, and all of these things. And so it made me think about the kids that I work with, the people that I work with. And it's basically that you just, you can't go anywhere. You can't go to parks. You can't go to school. You can't go to your cousin's birthday party. Um, and I'm going to go through very quickly in terms of the research that we did. The psychological impacts, 92% per, of the kids that, of the 500 samples that we did um, included, talked about harmful psychological impacts. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about clinical depression, um, suicidal ideation, uh, stigmatization, and uh, also completing and, and successfully completing suicide. Um, there were several people that I interviewed or called or reached out to, and I got an email from their parents or a letter from their parents saying my child killed themselves at the age of 17 because of the registry, but we'd love you to come visit and we'd like to talk about what happened. Um, and that was 20% of, there's 20% of the people that I interviewed, 500, had committed or attempted suicide. And that's probably a low estimate because with Human Rights Watch, they needed to see medical records that there was actually a suicide attempt. So 20% of the 500 that I interviewed had attempted suicide due to being raised on a registry. Um, exposure to violence. Um, kids, and you think about a 16-year-old or a 14-year-old kid walking around on the registry. When people and vigilantes look on the registry, they just look for people that have committed offenses against children. They don't really care who they are. Um, and the other thing to remember is that many and most, we're doing a study right now, most of your registries that you'll look at, so you'll put, pick up the Texas registry, registry, you can't see when the offense actually happened. So you might have a 35-year-old man who committed his offense at 14, and it says victim under 12. So everyone just goes and sees this 35-year-old man who has a victim under 12 and assumes that he is looking and trolling for children. Um, and as a result, there were about five people that I interviewed that were subsequently killed by vigilantes. They were children that went on the registry. Um, impact on families. Something that's really interesting now that we've had children on registries for over 20 years is we have a new generation called children of children on registries. So that means the child that thinks it's normal to not have their, their parent be able to come to school because they're on a registry, that can never have a birthday party at their house, um, that might not live with their parent, uh, and that for many reasons might be homeless because they're moving around with their parent that's on the registry. And that's a whole new generation that we have. Um, the other thing are housing problems that we just talked about. And many times these apply for children that are trying to get out of juvenile facilities and their parents can't take them um, because of either they have a child in the house, a younger child, whether it's the victim or not, um, a younger child, or because they live near a school or in a residency zone. Uh, barriers to education, and I love to say that because we're not talking about college. We're talking about elementary and high school, kids that can't go to school. Um, barriers to employment. Now, under the Adam Walsh Act, um, you're on your registry form, on the website, you have to have your, so if it was NYU, it was your employer, NYU has to go on your registration form and on the website with you. So talk about a little bit barrier to, hey, will you hire me? Um, and NYU, by the way, is going to be on my page on the sex offender registry. Um, economic issues, of course, the fees and not being able to get a job um, and all of those things. And these are things that are happening in, in, to kids. Um, privacy is a big one. This is a 14-year-old kid in Louisiana. And these are the two pieces of identification that he has to get when he got out of the facility as, a as someone on the registry. Um, and as you see, it's emblazoned on the bottom. So he has to get a driver's license, even though he can't drive. It's required if you're on the registry, and a state license. And emblazoned on that is the term sex offender um, at the bottom. And so that's a big problem. I won't get to that now. 
Um, and so that becomes a big problem. And just the story with that young man, um, one thing, he was really depressed when I went to visit him in Louisiana, and I talk, we talked about, why don't you try out for the football team? And he did that fall, and I knew the day that tryouts were happening, and I called, and he said, I ran out of there. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, you have to get weighed, and then you have to show your ID, and they know that I'm, he's able to go to school where he lives in Louisiana. But I had to pull out my ID, and everyone was looking, and they would have seen that I'm on the sex offender registry, so I couldn't try out for the football team. Um, and just when you think about it, especially because the coping me mechanisms that children do not have and dealing with the same things that adults have to are basically um, a lot of what life is on the registry. The last thing, too, is when we think about Okay, the most mild thing, I don't know, I'll take a po I won't take a poll, but the most mild thing people think that might be happening to people on registries is going to register. It's going like going to get your driver's license. For a child, it often means, for instance, in Delaware, it's not a big state, but in Delaware, the only place you can register is in Dover. That's two and a half hours away from Wilmington. And as a child, you have to go there by yourself. You can't take a parent with you. We found out that you can take a lawyer. That means that they have to travel through the state. It could be every month. Um, that's money. And not only that, and I'm not saying that people are always praying, but children have to sit in the same waiting room as the person who is a licensed, in, I mean, a clini clinically diagnosed pedophile. And so children have to sit in the same room. Um, so there are so many stories of children being followed. You sit this close to the person that's on the registry and they get your information, they can hear your address. So many children have been followed, uh, called a lot of girls that are on the registry. So we're just treating children like horribly and that's pretty much the life, life on the registry. Thank you for that very bleak picture. <laughs> um, but that, Nicole conveyed how even what seem like minor procedural elements of registration can be incre incredibly onerous. I wonder, David Feige, in your travels around the country, what have been the most difficult aspects of registration and notification for the people you've encountered? It's interesting. I, I mean, I think Nicole has done a wonderful job of, of, of explaining it. And certainly, the regime of, um, of, of, of registration is difficult. But you know, there's also, as, as she pointed out, there's a raft of other ancillary laws, I mean, that, you know, and Dana touched on as well. I mean, from, you know, the movement in New Jersey to bar sex offenders from winning, you know, from accepting lottery winnings to, in New York, uh, something that says you can't be a volunteer firefighter if you're uh, on, on the registry, to a very commonplace one, which is bans from parks and all kinds of other, all kinds of other places. And so, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the very affecting stories that we that we shot was um, w was a woman who'd been on the registry also since she was since she was young, who's now 32 and has two and has two kids and does deal with the heartbreak of not being able to go to your kid's baseball game, not being able to take your daughter um, to to her recital, and also and one of the last refuges uh, places of refuge that they had was this park. And Oklahoma then expanded their park ban to include city, county, local, state, and federal, basically everything, period. And, you know, we sort of followed her on this sort of heartbreaking day where she took her kids for the last time to the park and had to explain, well, I can't bring you back here anymore. Like, that's done. And so there are all these little things which seem, you know, if you think about it from the outside, they seem mere inconveniences or indignities. But in fact, have a tremendous impact. The, the ID is also, in her case, she said, you know, I take my kids to the doctor. Mm. And, I, and I check in and I pull out my license and I am under suspicion immediately. You know, they may have strep, they're immediately like checking the kid, you know, it's this, so it's this sense of being constantly watched. It's a sense of being constantly scrutinized and judged in these very painful and personal ways. Um, which again, from the outside seem negligible, but from the inside are very, very powerful and constant. And I think the other thing, the other thing about it is you live with it all the time. I think one of the things uh, I, I, I'm guessing that Nicole would, would, con would sort of confirm is this sense that it is with you every, every day, every minute of every day you wake up and you're walking around and you're never fully free. You're never fully 
able to just be. And, you know, again, it sounds a little diffuse and it sounds a little silly, but I think in the lives of the people who are registrants, that's a very, very profound and very trying experience. Yeah. So with that being true, generally across the board, there are differences among jurisdictions. The content of registration and notification law still varies tremendously between jurisdictions. I can attest uh, to what Nicole said about Louisiana. As a former public defender there, it is true that registrants have to fund a postcard campaign and a full page advertisement in the local newspaper advertising their release to their community with a big picture, sex offender warning, and it costs a decent amount of money. If you don't have the money, you can't do it. You fail to comply. So I have two questions um, related to that. And one is, do any of you have a sense of which jurisdictions right now are the worst in terms of the onerousness of registration and notification regimes? And after that, I want to move on to the offense of failure to register. I, I don't, I'll let these guys answer that, but I just wanted to throw in, you know, it's not as though registration is the only <clears throat> form of supervision or restraint, right? This is layered on top of parole conditions in yeah. the federal system, supervised release conditions, or GPS. if you got probation, <laughs> probation conditions. And this just comes to mind because just last week I had a client who got probation for his offense, um, but he can't use a smartphone. Right? And you think about, a, as a condition of a supervised release, this is on top of all the, all the other things we're talking about here. You, you know, he was a, a salesperson. You, you can't exist in the world if you don't have mobile access to email now, right? So I, I just want to throw out there that it's not just the registration restrictions we're talking about. This is layered on top of a, a whole other regime that's, right. that's in place anyway. And G yeah, GPS monitoring right. <laughs> for right. many, many. And on top of the term that they just finished a sentence as well. They served their time. Um, and um, in terms of the sort of the most onerous states, I just say any state, um, pick a state. Now, there are only there are 40 states and that register children. And um, out of those 40 states, um, New York is not one of those states, to tell you the truth. But as we know, the age that children can go into the adult court is very low here. So in certain fashions, children are on registries. Um, but the, har the harshest states I would say right now for children are South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and Delaware. Um, and because of the long-term nature of them, South Carolina is the one, is one of them where it's lifetime GPS, which means, and we have to talk about, GPS means that you have a something equipped, or something to your ankle all the time. You can't bathe that ankle. And it's lifetime GPS for juveniles. It's um, lifetime registration, lifetime public notification, and residency restrictions. Um, Florida, a very similar thing. Texas, uh, it's 10 years registration. But what people don't know is that 10 years starts. It doesn't start ticking until after probation. Most kids are on 20 years probation in Texas. So and if you get arrested or anything, the clock stops ticking. So your registration doesn't start for 20 some years and then you have 10 years and if it's interrupted, that clock stops ticking. And we'll talk about the failure to registers or those arrests that can come. Um, and Delaware is another one, even though it's the first state and a small state, they've been actually registering children since 1990, which is earlier than the federal law and its lifetime. So in terms of uh, those are some of the harshest states for children. But one thing I do want to say, because I know this is coming up, and I know this might be a sort of elephant in the room, is that there has been absolutely no studies in the 20 years. They've tried. There have been studies, but there has been no study to show that registration laws and notification laws are effective in preventing sexual violence. You, you so. can take that as a preview for tomorrow's panel right, right, online right. about <laughs> the efficacy of registration and notification laws on rates of offending. Why don't we move on to failure to register? And David Patton, since you brought it up before, could you explain the federal offense and just give us a, a quick overview of how it's enforced? Sure. Uh, and just for some clarification, it occurred to me, we, we throw around a lot of different names for different statutes. The 2006 statute is generally known as the Adam Walsh Act. It was actually a collection of many, many different statutes. It did a whole lot of things. It increased mandatory minimums for all sorts of federal sex offenses. It uh, 
uh, made bail conditions much stricter. It called for the civil commitment of, of uh, federal offenders after the term of imprisonment. So SORNA is one piece of the Adam Walsh Act, and in itself is a very complicated, lengthy piece of legislation. And as I said earlier, one piece of it is requiring the states to conform their registries to certain requirements. The other piece was creating a federal crime of failure to register, um, which carries with it a maximum penalty of 10 years in jail. Uh, I will say that most of our clients face uh, guidelines ranges, meaning what they're probably going to get in the range of a year and a half up to four or five years, depending on their criminal history. That's just for the failure to register. And again, that's probably on top of a state crime of failure to register. And it may be on top of a probation violation or parole violation. So these things can, can stack. Um, <clears throat> the crime itself uh, has basically three elements. One element is that you are subject to SORNA, meaning you're a sex offender who's required to register. And again, we've talked about how broad that is. Um, the second element is one of two things. Either you uh, were convicted of a federal sex crime and just failed to register wherever you are, or you uh, are a sex offender based on a state conviction, but you traveled uh, to a different state and failed to register in, in that new state. Um, and then thirdly, that you knowingly didn't register. Uh, that might seem like it's a big out. It's not. Keep in mind uh, your first year crim law, uh, it's not a defense to say I didn't know that I was supposed to register. You just have to know you didn't in fact register. So it's a very, uh, uh, you know, I, I suppose somebody who went to wherever they're supposed to go to to register and filled out all the forms, but it didn't quite make it onto the system for some reason might have a defense, but otherwise you're, you're out of luck. Um, I'll say as public defenders, and I'm sure my former public defender colleagues can, can agree with me on this. Um, you know, our, our clients' lives, no matter the offense, are generally full of all sorts of sadness. Uh, family dysfunction, poverty, um, mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Uh, you know, sadness pervades. Um, failure to register cases uh, are up there. Uh, they're almost uniformly really awful, sad scenarios. Um, yeah, just a couple weeks ago, we had a client who um, has an IQ of 50. I'm not exaggerating. Um, his offense, uh, he's in his 40s now. His offense was when he was in his 20s, had consensual sex with a 15-year-old. At the time, he, I mean, he still can't read or write. Uh, he could recognize about half the letters in the alphabet. Um, uh, ju and, and that's on top of all sorts of mental health issues, bipolar disorder and, and other things. Um, he spent eight years in his state of conviction um, and then moved to New York. Uh, he was supposed to be on the registry for 10 years uh, under his state's law uh, and got to New York, um, didn't register, truly didn't have the faintest idea of what he was supposed to do or go through. Um, and uh, was arrested for failure to register, um, sat in prison for um, a year before we finally prevailed on the U.S. Attorney's Office to do the right thing uh, and give him a deferred prosecution. So they actually did the right thing, but he spent a year in jail. Um, mm -hmm. For someone that, it, it, this was his one and only conviction in his lifetime uh, and hadn't had a criminal offense in, in, in 10 years. Uh, and was just, you know, and uh, yes, maybe that's an extreme example of cognitive impairment, but I could truly go on and on about the, the types of clients that we see uh, coming to our office on, the, on these offenses. And I was going to say registration is often a piece of, or, and done in conjunction with much more restrictive, um, much, much more restrictive uh, conditions in, when, when one is on, say, probation. In, in many states. And, you know, the other, there's the piece of failure to register, and then there's the bit about the absolutely uh, vast number of probation violations and release violations. Um, you know, we've seen uh, an instance where somebody, you know, thought they had a job, 
went to another, went, took a bus to another city, informed their probation officer, the job fell through, called and said, look, I'm trying to get back, but I don't have enough money. He said, fine, call me when you're back. Five days later, after literally panhandling, gets enough for a bus ticket, goes back, it's a violation because you, you, you should have been back two days ago. And went to prison for that. Gets out, is still on the, GP, still on the GPS, commutes almost an hour to a job at a car wash, seven minutes late for curfew, according to the GPS, is four blocks away at the time, gets a four and a half year sentence for that. Um, so there are a lot of conditions on top of the straight up registration that are often uh, imposed in conjunction with probationary or other release sentences that also make uh, coping with life on the registry or on sex offender probation, particularly onerous and difficult. One quick uh, note, if any of you have questions, please write them on the cards and send them to the people collecting them because we'll start the question and answer soon. Um, just one or two more questions on this point. I know in Louisiana, failure to register, as you, you began to say, David, it doesn't mean necessarily that you never show up to sign in at all. It means you fail to comply with any of the many, 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 many requirements that registration and notification entails. Um, is, is that in, been- Including frequent updates. Including yeah. frequent updates, the requirement to provide all of your internet aliases, right. um, everything that it right. entails. Yeah. Do you want to speak briefly about how that provision is enforced against juveniles? Right, and, and as, as, David, as David was talking about, when someone goes to register, they have to sign a form with about 100, 150 things that they're going to do or not do as a person that's on the registry. So if you have a 50 IQ, or you're a child, frankly, um, you're just initialing. And so any of those things that are not done and you're caught not doing, that's a failure to register. So it could say, you can't walk on the left side of the street at any time, and you're signing for it, and if you're caught on the left side of the street, you could go to prison. Uh, but it's not that easy, but just very quickly, two quick things. Um, one is a young man that left uh, um, his facility, his prison, juvenile prison at the age of 16, and he wanted to continue with his education, and asked his, went back to his person and said, his probation officer, and said, I'd like to go to school, and they said, well, you can go to a virtual school. Um, and so he started going to school, an online school, and when he went to register, he realized he did not register that email identifier, and he was put in prison for it failing to register. So again, we have to talk about these are children adjudicated delinquent in juvenile court that are being convicted of, of felonies for technical violations. So again, we have this legal problem here because it's not committing an act of offense as an adult, but you're being convicted. Um, so the second one, which is the most common story of children is a young man that went on, was arrested at the age of 11 for pulling his pants down in a bunch of, a bunch of kids. Um, he went to the prison, juvenile prison, uh, and got out at 17. And because his family members all had, his siblings all had children, he couldn't go live with them. And in this part of Texas, not having an address is a violation of your registration. He was homeless and was uh, convicted and put in prison for two years. Um, same thing happened when he got out after two years. So second time, second stint in prison for two years. Same thing happened again, his third stint in prison for two years. So he's now in his 20s, late 20s, um, and um, he got out, found a, white, found a woman, got married, and he really wanted to start providing for her. And um, he was, I was talking to him when I was writing the report, and he started to seem very stressed and worry about money. And he did get caught with receipt of stolen goods and went to prison. I went down for that hearing. And the judge said, because you are a career criminal, um, mind you, his only act of offense before this was pulling his pants down at 11, I am going to max you out, and you are going to get 12 years in the Texas penitentiary. And that is how failure to register. That is not an uncommon story. That is a common story with children. Every time Nicole speaks, I think we need five minutes of <laughs> silence to process. <laughs> all right, we have a number of audience questions. Thank you all so much for setting them up. So I'm going to read a few to the panelists. A couple of these are similar. And the question is, are there jurisdictions that are doing things better that are, um, I'm going to add, spontaneously, not through litigation, well, are there jurisdictions that are doing things better 
What are they doing? Where are they? And if anyone wants to address the changes in California, that would be great. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I think, let, let me answer that in three ways. Number one, there are places, certainly in the civil commitment arena, there are places that are much better than others. There are places like Minnesota that have never released anybody, and places like across the border in Wisconsin that actually do take the, the idea of treating and releasing people seriously. Um, and so there are huge differences in, in release rates um, for civil commitment around the country. Um, I think there are places that are easier to live, probably chief among them, and perhaps Interestingly, the place that has the highest number of registered sex offenders of any state, Oregon, where, by the way, one out of every 76 men is on the registry. Um, that's true. Um, and it's, it is the highest rate. But in part, that is because um, it is a relatively uh, decent place to be able to, to, to live and navigate your life on the registry. Um, you know, I don't want to, like, put that out everywhere. Go to work. Uh, because, you know, th it's, this is the kind of thing where two seconds after anybody hears this, you know, there were sort of wars across Florida uh, among, among local jurisdictions to increase the number. Well, if that county has 1,000 feet, we're going to make it 15. Well, if you make it 15, we're going to make it 2,000. And there were these crazy escalating sort of municipal, municipal sort of wars, as, as Dana was saying. Um, in terms of California, the recent Supreme, the, the recent Supreme Court case from the California Supreme Court case is what you're talking about, um, did a very interesting thing. It did not abolish residency restrictions, but it did require a much more detailed analysis of when they were and were not appropriate. And that was really a, that was really a first. And that came out of a San Diego, a San Diego case. I actually talked to the lawyer just before she argued it, and she's, she's fabulous. Um, and, and really knocked it, really knocked it out of the park. And what that has done is created essentially a waivable presumption um, and required uh, an, an analysis. Because you know the other thing that we haven't really talked about are recidivism rates, which are far lower by and large. Should I leave that out? That is also a preview for tomorrow's preview panel. For tomorrow, <laughs> uh, where I won't be here. But, um, but, but you know, there, are these, there are these risk assessments. There are some questions around you know how effective and and how predictive they are but those things do exist and there is at least theoretically the option to figure out who's really bad and look let's make no mistake there are really bad people they exist the question is who are they how do we identify them and are we casting are we casting too wide a net and deciding that too many people are should should be in that category that actually leads to another question we've been asked by an audience member, which is, does anyone deserve to be on the registry? Should anyone be on the registry? Now, without venturing into empirical questions about recidivism rates and the efficacy, I'd love to hear each of your perspectives on whether we should have anyone on the registries at all. David Patton, will you start? Oh, I, I think it's a little hard to divorce this from the empirical evidence, right? Because that seems to be the I, I won't say it's the rationale behind the current laws because I don't think they're rational, but it's at least the justification for a lot of the current laws. Um, and so I suppose to the extent that you could show that uh, for some um, class of people uh, that we can determine with some degree of uh, uh, confidence that it would really prevent serious crimes. I suppose we could look at it. I guess, you know, I, I just look at it, why, why the hysteria about this particular crime, right? I mean, there are more serious crimes, right? Uh, I mean, murder, for example, right? We don't have a murder registry. Um, and uh, uh, there are, um, I think, uh, th there is, uh, and, and I don't, again, you, you know, you have to be careful about how you talk about this because I don't want to diminish the seriousness of a lot of, you know, really um, troubling sex crimes that, that we ought to be concerned about. But there is a certain level of hysteria that has taken over here, and, and I don't know what the registries really accomplish. Um, and so the case hasn't been made to my mind that they're worthwhile at all, but I suppose to the extent they are, you'd have to really dig into the empirical evidence. I think it's important to um, 
go back to the roots of registries. Um, there's a great book called Knowledge as Power, which is, traces the history of registries, which I would definitely recommend. <clears throat> the initial goal was to provide police with people who they could go and follow up with if something happened and they were investigating an offense that was related. And we went from this registry as a tool for law enforcement to the registry as this public community notification scheme that then subjects people to all of these other restrictions. So are there people who belong in, you know, on, on a list that law enforcement can check up on? Sure. But the important thing to remember is that there's no, at least in New York, I, I don't know otherwhere, but there's no level zero registry, right? If you're convicted of a registrable sex offense, you are on the registry. And most people can't get off of the registry for at least 20 years, some people for life. So should there be a way, setting aside whether or not there should be a registry, should there be ways for people who have been living for several decades, who have gotten married, had children, established jobs, gone to college, you know, done everything that they can to move forward with their lives to get out of this scheme, I would say there definitely should be. For, for purposes of children, no, absolutely. My job, absolutely not. My job is to eliminate the practice of placing children on registries, and that's what I'm doing right now and plan to do. Um, I think that there are 10 states that do not register children. Those 10 states are not less safe than the other states. So we can take a breath and say, remove all children and let's, let's start again at looking at things. Um, the other thing that I, I, I just want to say is that when we talk about do they deserve to be on the registry, I just want to say, as just what I just recently did, the 500 kids I interviewed, we reconfigured and looked at the data um, and uh, so, and looked for the question of what was going on right before the child committed the sex offense. Out of the 500 people I interviewed, 100% were in the child welfare system for some form of maltreatment. So when you talk about do they deserve to be on a registry, they deserve to have their trauma treated. They deserve to be treated like children. And it's a very logical step of why there was an offense that put them on a registry. And if we're not treating that trauma, we're, ending up, we're, we're actually really hurting a lot of children. So they, are, they were victims right before they went on registries. So no, absolutely, children should not be on registries at all. And I will stake out something of, a middle, something of a middle ground. I think it is important. I think that it's important to draw a distinction between community notification and, registra and registration to begin with. I think it is important to draw a distinction between children and adults. And I also think that there is a place. There are bad, there are, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say bad people, but I would say that there are people who do bad things, and some people who do bad things repeatedly, and that's problematic. I think I have not been convinced that there is no value, no value to some of these to some of these laws, but I am convinced that they are applied too broadly, to uh, with without the kind of nuance um, that astute lawmaking would require in order to make this a better system. All right, most of the other questions relate to the two topics that our second two panels will cover, either <laughs> risk assessment and appropriate modes of individualized risk assessment and targeting of sex offender registration and notification regimes, or prospects for reform. So I hope that all of you will either tune in or later watch those panels. Please give a huge round of applause to our excellent panelists. Thank you again for being here. And if you need information about the other two panels, we'll be here. <laughs>